I said the girls have better than seeing her ring. Forwarding now. Just want to give you all a heads up. <laughs> Okay, all right, thanks everyone for coming to uh, the seminar tonight after dinner. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Corey Garza. Uh, he's an associate professor of marine science at the School of Natural Sciences at Cal State University uh, Monterey Bay. Uh, he received his bachelor's in biology at Cal State University Los Angeles. I uh, got his PhD at UC Santa Barbara in the Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology uh, Department. He's been a research ecologist with uh, NOAA, um, as well as a chief scientist for the US EPA, Long Island Sound Study, and has held several postdoc positions as well. Um, he's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the work that he's been doing around Catalina. So please help me welcome Dr. Garza. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming by, stopping by after dinner. Uh, so the work I'm going to talk to you about uh, today, it's work I've been involved in for about 25 years now. Um, actually, I first came out here, I think a lot of you are new students, I actually first came out here in 1993, and so I started working on this when I was a very, very young undergraduate uh, back then. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about sort of the history of a particular interaction that's uh, been ongoing out here on Catalina Island. That's the interaction between uh, the California mussel middle, the Californianus, and the Pacific spiny lobster, Opening Laris interruptus. Uh, some of the work that we've been doing currently with this, as well as kind of where we're going with it in terms of looking at this interaction between the context of a changing environment down here in Southern California. Um, and just before we get started, you know, there's other folks involved with this, uh, collaborators on this. My graduate student, uh, Taylor Eddy, who's out here this summer heading up our field team. Uh, Steve Litvin, who's our stable isotope expert at uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Uh, Dan Orr, who's my former uh, GIS technician, now he's running the GIS uh, program for National Audubon Society. Uh, Carlos Robles, who's a professor mm -hmm. emeritus at Cal State LA, and Jason Smith, uh, who's a professor down at Cal Poly Pomona. So uh, the story really begins with sort of uh, what we refer to as keystone species. And if, if you're not familiar with them, it's actually sort of one of the first fundamental sort of ideas that we had in ecology. It was actually an ecological concept that was introduced uh, back in the late 1960s by uh, Bob Payne, who was a former uh, professor at the University of Washington. He passed away uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and so he published a couple of papers in 1966 and in 1969 where he really introduced this idea of something he called a keystone uh, predator. And what he was really proposing there is that in certain systems, you could have a species that has a disproportional effect relative to its overall abundance, uh, particularly in terms of trying to sort of regulate a competitive dominant in a particular community. And so his work in particular was based on about 10 years of experimental research that he was doing out on an island called Tatoosh Island just off the coast of Washington, where every month for about 10 years he was going out and removing these sea stars called Pisaster and looking at the response of the community that was out there. And the particular uh, population that he was looking at was the California mussel, uh, Midos californianus. And what he saw over about that 10 years is the areas where he took these sea stars out of, you know, these mussel beds just expanded, they overgrew everything and drove down overall species diversity. And so he termed these Pisaster as a keystone species. But beyond just general sort of marine ecology, what I sort of do with my own work, you know, his sort of work actually led to decades of studies in ecology where we started looking at the functional role of species in communities. Um, it, I mean, it was so pervasive at the time, his influence. Uh, you had the 1970s, it seems like we read papers from that time, about every other paper is about a keystone other or something. I mean, people had things like keystone herbivores at that point. And so it was actually, it was a real sort of massive fundamental concept in ecology. In fact, a lot of his work also gets used in basic conservation biology. If you're not familiar you know, with the system here, this is kind of the general sort of outline of how it works. You could have sort of two rocky intertidal benches up in the Pacific Northwest, you know, very diverse things like barnacles and mussels and algae. You leave sort of one sort of system, let it go as it is. This would be the system where Bob would go out and you know, pull sea stars out. And about 10 years later, that system reverts to this a homogenous stand of mussel beds. And this is in general, what this sort of process would look like to remove the sea star. If you let the sea stars come back, over time the community would revert back to looking something like this. <clears throat> and here's an example of this actually playing out in the real world. This is a project uh, that I worked on with some collaborators up in a place called Banfield up in British Columbia about a decade ago. And this is a band. We were actually sort of replicating some work that Bob did. We were also looking at some additional uh, dynamics within that system. And so here's one of these beds here. We were kind of, we started off, this is year one. We haven't removed anything. 
A year later, you can see all these muscles have already started to move into the lower edge there. And so it actually happens pretty quickly in this case. It's a pretty sort of rapid sort of change that you tend to see in these types of systems. <clears throat> and in general, this is what you wound up with. When you start thinking about keystones and what they do here, you have to refer to as the classic static theory in terms of how we thought about how benthic systems were organized here where you had kind of a, a system here, a lower edge to a muscle bed in this case here. You had sea stars would kind of go up and down when the high tide would come in. Sea stars tend to come in. They forward at the lower edge, and they go back down. It was considered to be in this kind of equilibrium state. And then you would have a few muscles who just by pure chance would just kind of get overlooked by sea stars here, and they'd grow into the, these invulnerable size classes you know, that sea stars could need. And this is kind of the, the general theory that we had in terms of thinking about how ecological systems work in, in relation to something like a keystone. <clears throat> However, you know, over the years, we started to see sort of observations that are really counter uh, to the keystone uh, theory. <clears throat> the first has to do uh, with Bruce Mengi and Jane Luchenko, uh, which is funny enough because the project they were working on was actually going to look for keystones in the tropics. And what they found was a totally different type of predation system, known as diffuse predation in this case. Where in this example here, you didn't get a shift in the community until you removed every single predator from that system. It wasn't just one predator that controlled everything, that sort of regulatory sort of responsibility was shared amongst the larger community of predators. Um, some work I did for my own PhD work here, uh, looking at sort of productivity drivers of predation. In this case here, it wasn't that you just had keystone predation happening for predation's sake, it was actually being triggered by varying levels of productivity in the system. And so there was kind of an underlying triggering mechanism for when and where you saw these types of keystone responses. Another paper I published with colleagues back in 2009 is you could also, as opposed to getting regulation of a, of a competitive dominant in a system like muscles, you could actually get extirpation of the competitive dominant. Um, in this example here, we actually artificially drove up population number of pisaster in certain areas so that what we did was we kind of replicated Bob's experiment removing sea stars off of these benches. What we did was the sea stars, instead of just throwing them in the water, we actually added them on to existing benches or pies apps with us. So we actually were able to sort of drive up the predation rates there. And what you saw was it wasn't a real sim it wasn't as simple as sort of was originally described in the 60s. It was a much more complex sort of interaction between predator and prey in the system. But that aside, you know, we still see sort of keystone concepts being used all over the place. Now, even outside of basic ecology, we see it used quite a bit in conservation. Sort of one of the best known examples is the example of wolves and elk in Yellowstone here. For a number of years, wolves have been extirpated primarily through hunting up in Yellowstone, and they were actually using sort of these basic keystone concepts to reintroduce them as a regulatory sort of mechanism to control elk. And so you see here this photo from the National Park, there were some wolves chasing down elk. And what you saw, uh, this paper by Ripple and Betchda in 2012, they actually reported on about, I think it was about a couple of decades of this reintroduction of wolves here. And what you see are where the wolves increase, you start to see the elk decrease. And what you saw were increases in different types of education there that were primarily fed on by different types of herbivores that also happen to be in there. So you can start to see some of this keystone effect start to come into play in this particular system. So it's a pretty widespread phenomenon that's just not sort of regulated within a marine system. And so when we go to marine systems, such as around here in Southern California, we have different types of management approaches that we use. One of the best known ones that were known as NPAs or marine protected areas. And this is where you tend to see things like keystone concepts get applied to their design. Because when we use NPAs, one of the things we tend to use them for is for fisheries management and regulation. And oftentimes, what you're managing or regulating for is a top level predator many times. We're thinking about economic, economic fishery species here. <clears throat> now, the particular area where we're going to be talking about today in terms of NPAs is right here in Catalina. Um, so a lot of people might not know this, but Wrigley was actually one of the early NPAs in Southern California. Um, it's been around since about the late 80s or so. So it was actually established before sort of the larger existing network of NPAs that we have here in the state. And it's actually what we've been studying as part of this larger project that we're looking at. <clears throat> now, when you think about marine protected areas, you have to have a few general design philosophies built into them. One is you have to maximize connectivity amongst individual NPAs that you have them as a network. This is to allow for sort of transport of individuals back and forth between individual patches and NPA. It's also what you have known as rescue effect, where an NPA, a population NPA tends to crash, potentially be rescued by being connected to other NPAs that could restock it. It's sometimes known as a spillover effect. You also have to have different types of habitats that are in there. These have to be habitats that are important for foraging. Uh, we think about things like rockfish, 
you have to have sort of habitat where young can be reared. If you know anything about sort of rock bed population dynamics, well, they do live out on the rocks as adults. As juveniles, they actually live within kelp, and so you have to have those two types of habitat in there. But one of the issues that we're starting to recognize with some MPAs and the ways that they were designed is the scale of the habitat they, they were designed with, it's not always necessarily matching up with the scale at which their target populations actually interact with the environment. And this is kind of a good example here. It's one of my former uh, graduate students, Scott Tabe. And so he was working on a project, I think it was Black Surfer, but when Scott's out there, he's looking at, oh, kelp forests and boulders, that's all the real important stuff. Because he's looking at it from his perspective when he's doing his thinking about his design. You go here to my old buddy Pies Aster, I could care less about that. Uh, it's interested in small centimeter scale barnacles and gastropods and so on. It's not really caring about that. Right? And so what we're really thinking about is it's really experiencing its environment at a much, much smaller spatial scale that's really different from how we tend at scales in which we tend to design things like MPAs. And so that's really the heart of what we're looking at out here are things like scaling mismatches within current MPA design and sort of the overall performance of an MPA and a target species within that MPA. So the particular species that we're looking at is the, specific, the Pacific spiny lobster, Panularis interruptus. Pretty well-known species here, pretty charismatic species here in Southern California. Uh, it's generally ecology of forages at night. It comes out at night. <laughs> if you go diving, if you go diving a little bit later tonight, they'll be out, they'll be out eating. Um, it was documented as a keystone predator in kelp forest uh, by Paul Dayton and his colleagues uh, back in 1998. And it's also one of the larger commercial recreational fisheries here in the state, not by tonnage, but by economic output. By, ec by economic, it's about the third largest in the state. Remember, most of it is actually exported overseas. If I understand correctly, there's only actually a handful of restaurants in Southern California that actually serve Pacific spiny lobster from Southern California. The majority of it is actually exported, and that's what the real market is for right now. <clears throat> now, the lobsters on Catalina have been studied for a long, long time. And the person who really started first looking at that was Carlos Robles. This is Carlos back in his younger days. Uh, we used to joke with him. He used to have a lot of salt. He used to have, he had salt and pepper hair. We joked back then he had more pepper than salt. Now he's got more salt than pepper um, these days. But this is him in his early days, right, out here at Catalina when he was first investigating the ecology of Pacific spiny lobster. And what, he's, what he was interested in is he noticed there were mussel beds out here. And he figured that there had to be some large predator that was regulating them. But down here, Pisaster isn't a big part of the predator community. And what he eventually discovered is that it was actually a panularis, or the spiny lobster, that was actually regulating mussel bed uh, communities in this case here. People wonder, like, how do they eat because they don't have claws? Um, they have these big mandibles underneath. They look like two big molars. And what they do is they chip away at the shell of the muscle, and then they use their maxilla pit to sort of pull the muscle tissue. Out of there, and, that, and you can usually tell a muscle that's been eaten by a lobster because one end of the shell will actually be chipped away in this case there. And so they're actually been a main predator out here for a number of number of years. And in fact, this is some of that early documentation of Annularis actually foraging in the rocky inner tidal here. Um, years ago, I think I might have actually helped set up the camera rig for this. Uh, we used to have a series of underwater camera rigs that would actually set to take photos every 15 minutes over the course of a low tide cycle. And so what you're seeing here, sort of the initial tide coming in, you're getting some fish that are coming in. You get the sort of the higher high tide here, you start to see lobsters popping out into the inner tidal. This is out at Bird Rock, which is just across the way here. This is slack high tide here, and you can see all the lobsters foraging down here in the inner tidal. Tide goes back out, and the lobster is right back out with it. Um, what you notice, what we noticed early on, we used to actually do hand collections out there. They were mostly, most of the uh, lobsters foraging at that time, they were brooding, they were egg brooding females. So it's roughly about 70, 80% of the lobster that we pull up during any one of these high tide cycles, they were females and they were egg bearing females in this case. And so the hypothesis that we had was that what they're probably doing is they're probably foraging the inner tidal to offset a lot of the energetic costs that are associated with producing eggs here. So when they're actually eating something like a mussel, a mussel is a calorie rich food item. It's something that's actually going to help stimulate and sort of uh, support the production of eggs in this case here. The other thing about it, it's actually a somewhat of a predator-free zone as well. You're not going to get a lot of things that tend to forage on lobsters showing up in the high rocky inner tidal during a high tide. So it's somewhat of a physically stressful environment. It's also just a hard place for them to get. So we were funded about six years ago uh, by USCC grant uh, to come back out here and start to look at the assessment of this MPA. Because one of the unique features of this particular MPA and Carlos's data sets is he started doing this work back in about 1982. 
out at Bird Rock and just here at Fisherman's Cove. And he was actually doing basic ecology research. And about six years into his work, Fisherman's Cove was turned into an MPA uh, in this case. But he kept doing his work for years and years on end. And so what he actually had, just through sheer chance, it's one of the few sort of MPA projects where you've got a before, after, control, impact, paired series here. So in other words, you can look at two systems before and how two systems or how two sites were doing before an MPA, then how they were doing after one site was turned after an MPA. And you've got a time series of data where you can start to look at that effect. So it's one of the few, few data sets in the world that's set up that way. And it actually was just a pure chance, right, in this case. <clears throat> and so we kind of recognize that, wrote a grant proposal, the USCC grant, and they funded us to come out here and start to look at how this MPA was working. Now, the time that we came out, Carlos hadn't worked out here in about five years or so, so we had to go back and reestablish a lot of his older sites here. He has three benches, he had three sort of their 20 to 30 meter longshore uh, rocking or tidal benches here at Fisherman's Cove, and then two, about three uh, 20 meter long transects and transects out of Bird Rock. <clears throat> uh, what we do here is we've got these intertidal transects that we set up in the intertidal, and then subtidal transects that we also establish just adjacent to each one of the intertidal benches. We do our field work during the summer because that's when you've got the reproductive season for lobsters. We actually need to be able to find them when we're out here doing our work. Uh, what we do, uh, what we're initially doing is, well, let's go and see how many lobsters there are, right? Because your general hypothesis is going to be, well, this MPA's work, there should be more of them in the MPA, and there should be a lot bigger ones. So our initial sort of thing was, well, let's go out and do some general surveys and counts here. Um, so you're looking at a couple of my former students, uh, Sean Wendell and Mary McCormick, and what we do is we go out at night during the high tide, and we do intertidal surveys, and we do subtidal surveys here. Uh, what we do is we do hand collections, we bring them up, we measure them for length, we look at whether they're male or female, if they're female, we look at what the reproductive condition happens to be, and we note that down. What we then do, and it's sometimes really tiresome, is when you get your highest high tides, which are the best ones to do these surveys, you also, they're also followed by the lowest low tides, it's also the best time to do your intertidal habitat survey. So normally what we do is we have a three to four hour turnaround, where after we come back from diving, we're back, we're back out into the field actually doing our intertidal habitat survey. Uh, we don't do sort of traditional quadratic meter takes. Um, I actually grew up with the horrors of having to do that, of crawling around on your hands and knees and picking through things to do that. Uh, technology has made things a lot easier. So what we do now is we do photo transects. Uh, so we actually do lay out a transect line, and then we create these little um, tiny quadrats here using these are soccer cones here. <clears throat> and what we do is somebody will actually go along that with a digital camera and take a photo every half meter of one of those things. And then what we also do is we have somebody using what's called a total station. If you ever sort of driven on the highway, you might see a Caltrans cruise when they're doing surveys. It's the same thing that Caltrans crews are using here. What we do is we have actually a point or a bolt in the rock right in here. It's a benchmark. We know its height relative to mean lower low water. We set the total station up on that. What that allows us to do is it allows us to measure the position of each one of these cones here. We know that cone's position relative to mean lower low water. What we then do is we take all those photos. We take all that spatial information it allows us to rectify those photos into a GIS database where we get kind of a virtual photo transect that we can then subsample back in the lab using computer later on. So in the old days, this might have taken us about four or five hours to survey on hands and knees. It takes us about 30 minutes using photos now. We get just about the same amount of data that we would using more traditional methods. <clears throat> and so we did all that work. Like, all right, we finally did like a bunch of years of work and we put it all together. And what did we find? Okay, so this here is Fisherman's Cove, the MPA. This is Bird Rock, the non-MPA. This is total abundance. What we found were a much, much higher abundance of lobsters outside of the MPA than inside of the MPA. And then when we actually went and looked at what's the habitat that they've been utilizing over that time scale, this is, again, this is Fisherman's Cove. You notice you're getting a higher proportion of lobsters occurring in the intertidal relative to the subtidal. So a couple of trends that are immediately emerging is, one, more lobsters outside the MPA than inside. And when you actually start to look at habitat allocation, or if you're talking about as habitat preference, they tend, the majority of them seem to be foraging within like the intertidal habitat as opposed to the subtidal habitat. <clears throat> when we started looking at reproductive condition, because that's the other component, you've got this thing known as a spillover effect, where you anticipate you're going to have more lobsters, potentially more female lobsters, more eggs, and you're going to have this kind of production of eggs that spills out into the surrounding areas here. Well, when you look at reproductive condition between the two sites here, Bird Rock and Anike much has a much, much higher proportion of reproductive or egg-bearing females relative to the non-NPA. 
And so this is actually a, a female lobster from Bird Rock and on MPA, and that's their clutch of eggs right there. And so on a really big lobster, you'll get a clutch of eggs that's about the size of an orange right, in this case. And so these are really productive. We rarely find large females like this bearing eggs within the cove here. So there are some kind of really noticeable differences right off the bat. <clears throat> so just to summarize just this, quick, this part here really quickly, between locations, you have more lobsters observed outside the reserve. Larger lobsters tend to be outside the reserve, and a higher proportion of reproductive females outside the reserve. Okay, you get intertidal zone. When you start to think about having habitat segregation within these areas, you get more lobsters observed in the intertidal relative to the subtidal, and you see a significantly higher proportion of reproductive females in the intertidal relative to the subtidal habitat. All right, so that was a bit of a shock to me when we did that, because I came in going, yeah, the MPA is great, and I was like, okay, this is totally opposite of what I thought we were going to find. What's going on? All right, so this is where I have to think about, you know, a colleague on Greg Hyatt used to talk about you have to look at the habitat. I think his exact quote was, it's the habitat, stupid, right? There's an underlying difference in the habitat, right, that you're actually, that, that's different between the two. So luckily we had all that habitat data. So Sean, a lot of what he did is he would actually take those photo quadrats and then he would classify the habitat types back within the GIS database. And the one major difference he saw between bird rock and the cove was mussels. When you start to look at the habitat types at a sub-meter scale, you find a much higher proportion of the California mussel, middle Californianus, out at bird rock. However, here in the cove, you don't tend to find it popping up. And this is a major prey item for, for Candularis or the spiny lobster in this case. <clears throat> and so our assumption is it's this difference in the underlying submeter habitat that's potentially driving some of these differences that we're seeing between the two sites. So this is where we needed a way to figure out what if the heck are they eating. Now, when we first came out here in the I first came out in the early 90s, the way that you did that was gut content analysis. Yet you'd bring a lobster up, you'd crack it open, you'd go through its guts, the tail would magically wind up in the freezer, and then in a cocktail later on. <laughs> but uh, they're not allowed to let you can't do that anymore. Right? You can't do that anymore, right? You can't do that anymore. They like, wrote it, and they're like, no, you can't do gut content analysis. You need a non-lethal way right, of doing some of this stuff. So that's where stable isotopes right, come in in this case. <clears throat> so stable isotopes, you're not familiar, it's a way of using chemistry to figure out what something's eating. It takes advantage of the carbon and nitrogen ratios right, that are built into you naturally. Like all of you take on the chemical signature. Anything you eat, you're carrying some chemical signature of it in some way. One of the nice things about it, it's a non-lethal way in a lot of cases of figuring out what some, something's eating. The other thing that it does is it gives you a longer sort of time scale when something's eating. With gut content analysis, would have been what the lobster maybe happened to eat the day before or a few hours earlier. Whereas stable isotopes can actually give you sort of a longer time period, up to about six months of what something's been eating. So in other words, you get a better estimate of what's more of a regular part of the diet of lobster. So the way that we do that, um, you actually have to do a lot of collections. And that's kind of what we've been doing this week. <clears throat> you have to go out, you have to survey its potential prey array here. So luckily, Carlos was really good about having detailed notes on what these things normally ate, and that's what we use for our records. So you actually have to go out and collect different types of algae different types of invertebrates. We actually have to do water sampling for phytoplankton, in this case, to figure out what everything's eating out here. <clears throat> when we do the hand collection with lobsters, we had to figure out what's a non-lethal way of doing this. How do you, what, what do we get out of it? A colleague of mine said, well, you know lobsters will drop their legs. Like, what do you mean? <clears throat> so if you guys know anything about lizards, when you grab a lizard by its tail, it has a defense response where it drops its tail, takes off, regrows the tail. Lobsters do the same thing. If you can get them by the leg, you can actually pull the leg, and what it'll do, it'll remolt the leg about three molts later. So it looks like it's a defense response. In fact, sometimes we pull lobsters up, there's just legs already in the game bag because it drops them as a defense uh, response to this. So what you do is you can pull the leg, and then about two to three molts later, it'll regrow the leg in this case. So it's a really kind of reliable, non-lethal way of being able to actually do stable isotope analysis of the species. So this was actually Mary's job, and so she did a lot of this work, and this is what she found. She did her stable isotope work. She ran her data. It's called MixCR. It's actually it's an R script that was developed by Bryce Simmons down at Scripps. And what it allows you to do is figure out what's the total proportion of isotopes that make up a particular species diet uh, composition here. So what you're looking at here, this is the proportion of the diet for lobsters here in the cove. <clears throat> These are limpets, mussels, and crabs. What it's showing you is that pachygraphs and crabs so these are kind of the small ones that are out here, make up almost about 80% of the diet of lobsters here in the cove. If you go out, 
to bird rock, what you're seeing out there is the California mussels making up about 75% of the overall diet of lobsters that are out there. And so if you think about in terms of what they're eating, you can think about these lobsters as eating popcorn most of the time, and these are out here eating steak. Right, so these here are getting really skinny, they're not getting a lot of calories. These here are getting fat with a lot of, of calories and are actually able to reduce a lot of the egg that you'd like to see if you're thinking about sort of really successful MTA performance. <clears throat> and the other thing that was really sort of intriguing about it, and this is kind of the next step that we're going to, is that if you look at these blue dots here, this is actually the distribution of isotopes out at Bird Rock, okay, the, the isotope distribution. These dark blue dots are what we call the west end. It's kind of the far end of bird rock where you actually get all the mussels hanging out. These light blue dots are actually the far end, the east end, where you tend to go have boats landing out and there's actually very few mussels there. What you actually start to see is <clears throat> if you go along that shoreline distribution, you see a switch from lobsters, even at the, you might consider a small spatial scale, switching from eating predominantly mussels to actually going to a more nitrogen enriched diet, which over in this case here would be things like limpets and so on. And in fact, when you would plot out the size distributions, your largest lobsters and more reproductive ones would be on this end here. Your smaller lobsters, right, and less reproductive ones would be on that far east end. So even at what you might think is a sort of a small scale, they're actually sort of segregating the habitat on the scales of like tens of meters, right, in this case here. So it's pretty strong, it suggests there's some pretty strong habitat segregation going out at Bird Rock. <clears throat> And in fact, what Sean did is he then sort of took a lot of that transect data and he ran what's called a hotspot analysis. So what he was able to do is when we do our photos, we don't just do those band transect photos, we also do panorama photos of the, all the whole site. And what allows him to do it, it allows him to apply remote sensing methods to try to tease out muscle habitat. So in other words, he can start to look at what spatial scale does muscle habitat start to pull out as a significant component of that overall site here. And when he goes to a place like Bird Rock, what he's seeing is these little red dots here, these are our hotspots. Those hotspots are where muscles tend to show up. These hotspots don't tend to sort of pop out in your analysis until you get below a half meter in this case here. So in other words, it's sort of economically and ecologically important species. It's actually keying in on a habitat type that doesn't really pop up as a significant part of the environment until you get below a scale of a half meter. That's a scale below, that's a scale that's way, way below scales at which we normally might design something like an MPA in this case. Okay, and so it starts to get to sort of the, thinking about the importance of these microhabitat types and overall sort of MPA performance. And so what can we take away from this part of the study here? Well, it's a simple one. It's habitat matters, right, in this case here. And in particular, small scale type habitat really matters. And so this example here is that we really, if you want to sort of have a really effective MPA design for something like the lobster, you have to start to consider a higher resolution of habitat type distinction here. This case. And in this particular example, things like lobsters, that means incorporating more intertidal habitat types along with some of the subtidal habitat types that lobsters tend to like to use. And when you start to also think about reserve design, <coughs> is that you have to start to bring in considerations of microhabitat composition as well as the energetic potential of that microhabitat in your current design here. Because that energetic performance, in other words, that ability or capacity to be able to make eggs here. That ability actually tends to originate at sub-meter scales, right, and can really sort of depend on the underlying landscape composition of the system you're working in here. And so what we've been sort of proposing here is that beyond some of the traditional metrics, things like numbers and size and sort of um, balance between male and female and MPAs, is that this energetic performance, right, of a reserve can also provide a sort of another metric of sort of reserve performance or success. <coughs> now, <coughs> We started this about six years ago, and again, this work started in a way, way back in the 80s. But as all of this has been going on with sort of think, looking at basic lobster ecology and also thinking about MPA design, there's been another observation of the ecologists in Southern California have had that's been concurrent with a lot of the work we've been doing. It's really that over the last 40 years, we've had this decline in the cover of that muscle, the primary foraging, intertidal foraging habitat of spiny lobster all throughout the Southern California Bay. And it's not just one or two people making this observation. This observation has been made through photographic survey records by a number of ecologists in Southern California, as well as through large modern programs such as marine that have been down here. So there's a lot of data that's showing that this has been ongoing here. And you know, this decline, it has some pretty broad implications. Thinking about the provisioning of basic ecosystem services in Southern California, with one ecosystem service being providing foraging habitat for something like spiny lobster. And so 
we've seen a lot of change out here in Southern California. All right, one of the sort of comments I get a lot whenever I give this talk is, oh, Corey, Lena is not like mainland Southern California. It's really different. Well, and it's like, yes, yes, you're, you're correct, right? It's, like, it's not the mainland Southern California of today. It's, it's a remnant of the mainland Southern California 40 to 50 years ago. Okay, and I'll show you what you mean and what I mean in a few slides. So this is Bird Rock. This is the east part of Bird Rock. If you have ever been out there, this is just to the left of the staircase that's, that's carved into the rocks out there. So you get off on the boat there, this is just a little flat area on the left. It's a normal looking muscle bed. You know, I'll show this in colleagues, you know, up in Monterey, and it kind of looks like a rocky or tidal bench of Point Lobos. Right? And it's kind of dark and cool looking there. That's what it looked like in 1984. This is it now. This is in that same exact area in 2016. This was a couple of years ago of my lab who came up. Muscle beds are gone. It's been replaced by an algal community. I think you're getting cladophora that's coming in here. There's been a lot of nutrient enrichment due to, I think, birds and sea lions having taken sort of roost up in here. And in this particular, this particular year here, my dive team, they were diving without gloves or um, hoods because it was so warm uh, that particular year. So we've seen pretty massive shifts right, in the general appearance and the overall surrounding environment. This is the west end. <clears throat> so this is where we tend to find out on Bird Rock where all the big lobsters, all the lobsters with, with eggs, this is where they tend to hang out. This is Bird Rock, this is the west end of Bird Rock in 1989. This is a multi sort of layered muscle bed. You don't see these, a lot of these uh, in Southern California. This is what it used to look like in 89. There were remnants of this when I first came out here in 93. Uh, this is it now. Uh, all right, so this is it just after we started doing a lot of these lobster studies. Uh, there were little pockets of mussels the last time we had come out, they're gone. We went back out this year, their muscles are starting to come back, but nowhere near what we saw in that 1989 <clears throat> figure there. So right now, what it looks like is that some of the underlying habitat that these sort of lobsters use to actually sort of stimulate egg production, it's starting to disappear um, out at Bird Rock, or it's really on its way out. It's on, it seems to be on its last stand um, out there at Bird Rock. <clears throat> and this isn't new. This isn't something that's totally unexpected. A field uh, down at Scrip, he and his colleague, they actually published a paper in 2006 where they suggested we as ecologists had actually kind of missed the boat here, or literally missed the signal here. Um, what they suggested is that if you're starting to look at sort of environmental or atmospheric records, you know, that begin after the mid-1970s, uh, we've already kind of missed it because the, the climate change impacts have already happened um, at this point. But in fact, what he's getting at is that a lot of what we're sort of documenting has changed. It's kind of stuff that's been ongoing long before we really started to document it. And in fact, what people are starting to think is that we kind of missed the signal that the canary and the coal mine weren't things like large kelp plants or sort of large sort of species assemblages. It was some of the smaller things like barnacles, plankton, and mussel, things that we weren't really sort of sort of key in on looking at, key on looking at at that point here. And in fact, you know, this is a photo from one of the warming trends uh, that we had not too long ago here. And you can see <clears throat> there is bird rock in Southern California, this big warm water plume. Right, this is becoming a regular occurrence of these big warm water plumes coming up into the Channel Island system. And so to really sort of get a sense of how much we've lost and potentially where we're going, we really need a way to kind of go back a generation to see what these systems might have used to look like here. And a way that doesn't have the limitations of quadrat based data or SIP or fixed plot data, right, in this case. And that's where we can use photos. We have photo records. And so one of the things we've been doing, we've been working on with uh, Jason Smith and Carlos, we've been doing this massive photo, historic photographic survey where it lets us go back in time and look at what Southern California used to look like, what the ecosystems and the intertidal used to look like back then. So we can estimate what we used to have in terms of potential habitat, what we've lost, and potentially where we're going. And so this is our Cabrillo National Monument back in 1976. So this is a photo by Joy Zedler and Jack Engel. <clears throat> You can see these big boulders here. This was a common site, these massive boulders with sort of massive stands of mussels all over them. This is that same site in 2002 when we first started doing some of these photo survey approaches here. Boulders, same exact boulders, there's nothing on them uh, anymore. Or if there are, there's small little sparse patches of mussels. In fact, here's a zoom in of one of the few boulders there in Cabrillo that actually still had mussels on. You can see there's just a few little small patches on there. And this was a, a repeating trend all around an area that once sort of had sort of massive abundances of mussels. Uh, this is Crescent Bay in Orange County. This is in 1972. This is by Dale Sweeten. I mean, uh, currently works with NOAA. <clears throat> what you had here was a fairly large mussel bed. You can see the lower end there, the upper end there, went all the way around. You know, I've gone out there before. It kind of looks like a really nice little intertidal bench. Uh, this is it a couple of years ago. That's that little line just above there. That's what's left of the mussel beds out there. 
And so we've lost quite a bit of mussel habitat all around Southern California. In fact, this is that same site in 1973. This is what Southern California, Orange County used to look like in the early 70s. This is kind of what you would see at Tattoo Shine where Bob Payne first did a lot of his work. What you have here are massive aggregations of high zats are attacking massive aggregations of middle age. This is an interaction, and this is ecological knowledge that was really lost to my generation of ecologists. Um, you can, because when I sort of think about Southern California, I think about what people see now. It's mostly algae on the rocks, it's warmer, not a lot of invertebrates out on there. I can imagine my sort of baseline for what this system needs to look like is way, way off relative to what it used to be 40 to 50 years ago. Right? But this is what it used to look like right, in this case. So a big part of what we're doing is we're trying to go back in time and recreate what these systems used to look like. In fact, this is mussel abundance uh, from Bird Rock uh, going back to the 1980s. You can actually see this has been ongoing. It's been an ongoing decline. And you can see the trend that Carlos started back in the 80s. It seemed like it was already on a downward trend where he went from, you can see an average of these mussels coming about five square meters of area in a rock to where it's less than half a meter of area that they cover now out on Bird Rock, right, into what we see today. And so what we've been doing is we've been using technology. Uh, to try to help us ascertain what did we used to have and where might we be going. And so one of the things that my lab is known for is applying things like GIS, remote sensing, spatial statistics, to try to get a better handle on what ecosystems look like, how we can get data out of the systems a new way, and what are new ways that we can try and interpret things. You know, my generation, we were taught by really great sort of natural historians and ecologists, but one of the things that my generation had that they didn't have is we now have access to technology that they didn't have. And so we're actually coming sort of trained with this really great background in natural history, but we're also being trained with these really cool sort of techniques that allow us to merge the two and look for patterns that we might not have been able to pick up without the use of technology. <clears throat> so one of the things that we're doing right now is we need a way to try to figure out how can we sort of rapidly assess habitat composi composition over really large scales to try to assess what's out there and what used to be there. And this is where we're using remote sensing approaches. So right now we're being funded by BOA uh, through Marine around uh, with some uh, funding from NOAA. <clears throat> and we're doing this. This is an example of, of an intertidal transect out of Bird Rock. This is about 30 meters of a longshore transect uh, taken from sort of an overview here. And what we can do as opposed to going out there and trying to hand classify everything, we can take advantage of the fact that different objects in a photo reflect light back at different wavelengths. And so we can actually put something like this into a program like ArcMap, and we can train the software to pick up at what wavelength of light do different species reflect light back at to you. So things like laminaria or different types of red or, or mussels, they they're going to reflect light back at different wavelengths. So what we've done is we've actually trained the software to take that, what it does is it sort of figures out, okay, which of these pixels are following these different wavelength ranges, and then it reconstructs a photo where it shows you all the different pixel designations. So this, this orange here is one type of algae. This is the water. This is sort of the laminaras that are down there. And then what it tells you is over the course of that whole photo, what proportion of the pixels fall into the laminaria wavelength, coraline wavelength, the water wavelength, bare rock wavelength, muscle wavelength. And what you get is you get an automated way of doing percent coverages over a really large spatial scale in a really short amount of time. Right? Doing something like this by hand would take me four or five hours. The computer, the computer does it in five minutes here. And we have about a 98% accuracy rate right, between what we do in the field and what we can actually pull off with a computer. <clears throat> what this has now allowed us to do is we can actually now go back in time and sort of classify the types of habitat we used to have back in the 70s and try to get estimates of how much that habitat has changed going into modern times. So this is Crescent Bay uh, in Orange County. This is that sort of what, that long, that long short stretch of bench that I showed you. So what Dan Orr did is he figured out a way to get the software to only sort of identify muscles in that photo, and then because it was layered, you can actually get layering. You can't see it that well on here, but it actually is able to estimate how much layering was going on there. So you not only got sort of the long short extent of the muscle bed, he was able to estimate what was the actual vertical height of the muscle bed back in 1972? And what he's able to do is <clears throat> he's able to apply that algorithm to then pick up muscle coverage in 2003 and then 2016. And so what he's estimated is that over those years, that sort of 40 or 50 years or so, is what you've lost is you've lost about 10 square meters of overall muscle bed coverage in that site. And so now we have the capacity to do this with sort of historic photo data sets 
and then trend comparing them to what we have now here to try to get estimates of what we used to have, how much we lost, and what that, where that trend may be taking us. <clears throat> then the other thing that we need here is beyond needing a way to just go ahead and go back in time and figure out what we have, we need more modern ways of figuring out how to pick up what we have now. <laughs> Because right now, kind of the way we do it is we do this in kind of small patches of teams that might go out to a few sites to classify things. That's not necessarily going to get you all the information that you need because you might miss a trend here or there. <clears throat> so what we've been piloting this summer are autonomous drones uh, in this case here. Because drones can cover a lot of area in a really short amount of time. Um, and so what you're looking at here, just a couple of practice photos that we did about a month or so ago, just right here in the cove. Um, this was taken from about a height of, I think, about 10 meters. We're here using this particular model of drone. It's the DJI Phantom 4 Pro, and it's fully autonomous. So what we do is we actually find this bench here. We put a digital grid on. We tell it, fly over there, fly at this height, come back with the data. I think it did it in four minutes. Um, this particular photo here, it's actually able to resolve objects once you fully render the photos down to a scale of about 0.4 centimeters. So that's a scale of about a barnacle that you can see from an elevation of about 10 meters. You can fully put together, right, a whole rock in your tidal bench. So this is about, I think it's almost about 60 meters of the longshore length there that it knocked out in about four minutes there. That would have taken us, you know, a whole tide series, if not two tide series, uh, to do that. <clears throat> and then we're also building out sort of the whole drone fleet here to not just give us sort of instances, okay, what's on the rock there, but to also help us understand how the environment's changing, right, in conjunction with some of that habitat. And so the next thing that's, the next drone is coming in in August is this uh, DJI Matrice uh, 600 Pro. Uh, that allows you to swap in multiple in instrumentation packages. We can put in things like thermal imagers and hyperspectral cameras, and we can look at things like changes in water temperature or changes in phytoplankton, get estimates of phytoplankton abundance that are adjacent to the sites that we're working on. So that way we not just have a record of kind of the communities that are there, but we can also get a snapshot in time of what that community looked like. And then we can actually do really large scale surveys as well, so we can start to fit in some of these specific sites into sort of larger estimates of the whole environment there. Uh, the other thing that we currently have on campus is one of these fixed wing drones. It's made by a company called SenseFly. It's called an EB. It's black and yellow like a bee. So they call it an EB. <clears throat> this is a fixed wing drone that flies at a much higher elevation. It can actually stay in the air for a long time. get really large swaths of area down there. That gets you about a resolution of about two and a half centimeters. Uh, in this case, from a high of, I think, of about 400 feet, which is the maximum height you can fly with drones uh, these days. So what we have the capacity to do is to get a lot of data in a really small, small, a small amount of time at a really fine spatial resolution. And so what can we take away from this, or this whole story here? Well, our initial analysis, right, and observation we call it from all around sort of Southern California, in case of these muscle beds in the southern half, of Southern California, they're collapsing. Uh, they're on their way out. Um, and what you actually see, this collapse actually, it unfolded structural changes. Uh, what you actually see, you see the, lar the loss of first of the really large matrix muscles. So when I work up in Banfield, up in British Columbia, we get muscles that are easily like this big, about 20 centimeters in length, they're monsters. Those are the ones you start to lose first, right from some of the beds here. You start to get thinning of the bed, it then starts to fragment, and then before you know, the whole bed is gone. So it's actually, it's a repeatable pattern people have seen all around the area here. And sort of these ongoing collapses here, they really threaten to disrupt the ecological and economically important predator-prey interaction, that interaction between the spiny lobster and the California mussel, because we don't know what the implications of that are going to be going forward if you lose one of its key foraging habitats. <clears throat> and it's not just here in Southern California. Um, this is some more data from Marine. This trend is actually moving up to the northern half of the bias. Um, so this is actually fixed plot data um, from Santa Cruz Island and El Gria. And this blue line here, <coughs> these are muscle counts, or muscle abundance, uh, percent cover here. And you can see in the early 2000s, muscle cover is almost, it's collapsed out on the island. Uh, this is El Gria, it's pretty much collapsed up there. In fact, Bruce Mangi and Pete Ramundi were kind of doing some work going from the Oregon, sort of Monterey area, they're starting to see similar trends as well. So this is something that's kind of seems to be happening or just being initiated in certain parts of the U.S. West Coast outside of Southern California. <clears throat> the other thing that we take is that if our interpretation is correct and the effects of climate change, uh, they began the system a lot, lot earlier than we realized. Okay, because potentially we're probably looking at the wrong thing 
at the wrong time in this case. We were actually, because the signals are probably being hidden in things that are much, much smaller than we're used to observing and doing some, something like large ecosystem based marine monitoring. <clears throat> And what we can, might be able to infer here is that these shifts in regimes of ocean production, they're probably the primary, but they're probably not also the only cause of the change that we're seeing here. The other thing we take away from there is that, well, you, not, you may not be able to solve all the problems that are happening here in Southern California. Technology does give us sort of an advantage here, because now we're able to sort of pick up or get early detection on some of these trends here. Right, again, I talked about, I was trained by really great natural historians, really great ecologists. They just didn't have access to technology that I have today now. And so I'm able to take a lot of their training right, and integrate it with you know, today's technology here to try to help us find patterns that you couldn't find in the past without the use of the technology. And so you know, applying this, it's really going to allow us, right? when you start to think about coupling some of this stuff, this historic imagery, we get a sense of what we used to have here. But we're also going to get a sense of what used to be out there, sort of how much we've lost here. And that, these type of things can really help inform management. We're giving them a better sense of okay, where we actually need to go with you know, more modern, forward-looking management plans here. <clears throat> Some of these approaches we've talked about, they also can provide a method for really rapidly quantifying sort of critical habitat extent, whether it's for lobsters or something else in these systems, but also quickly picking up changes to potentially vulnerable habitat. <clears throat> Because beyond you know, what we're doing here in Southern California, we're using a lot of these technologies in other ways to try to understand how systems are changing. Uh, one project that my group has, uh, we're trying to predict instances of coastal disturbance. So this is a project funded by NSF. We're working up in British Columbia. So we have a whole other team that's up there right now. What we're doing is we're using high resolution mapping of intertidal communities and offshore topography, in this case here, and big ocean observing networks uh, to create predictive models of disturbance uh, in coastal communities. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do is we actually take these high resolution offshore bathymetric maps and then we pull data uh, from buoy arrays by, from NOAA, Ocean Networks Canada, and uh, DFO in Canada. <clears throat> we do is we can get an estimate of how much wave energy is coming from those offshore wave buoys there. We get an estimate of how much of that hits these offshore banks <coughs> here. And ultimately, we're able to predict with a scale of the near tidal bed how much of that initial wave energy actually impacts a real community here. And what we're able to do is can't make predictions as to when and where certain communities are going to be ripped off or disturbed on the rocks here. And we can apply these types of approaches to things like kelp forests, coral reefs in this case. And so we're able to use this to help us give us an advantage to make predictions in the future what types of marine communities are actually going to be susceptible to some of the effects of climate change, especially things like increased wave frequency and wave disturbance. Another place where we're using some of this is down in the Antarctic. Um, to really sort of think about improving ways of doing really complex ecosystem visualization. This is another grant that we have in my lab uh, through NSF. We're collaborating with Rutgers and uh, Mbari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And what we do is we're deploying sort of massive arrays of robotics down in Antarctica using things like lighters. Um, this is actually an Argo float that we deployed. Uh, we had that um, an Antarctic research vessel, the investigator, uh, send it out to the polar otter. Uh, one of my students said we should have called it the otter pop. <laughs> um, but it actually, I, I think it might have been like trademark infringement or something like that. But uh, <laughs> what these are is the gliders are actually really cool. They go and they get all types of things like zooplankton data. They can do mapping data. These actually have chemical sensors on them. So we can get instances, we can sort of do measurements of pH and chlorophyll concentration. Uh, we actually have teams that are down there that actually track some of these things. They actually have an animal that are tagged with satellite tags in this case. And what we're able to do is we're able to make these complex three-dimensional visualizations Look at how these ecosystems are interacting and being structured from the scale of small zooplankton up to the scale of things like whales and penguins in this case. And we can start to make predictions based on data coming off these Argo flows, how change in the surrounding chemistry or physical composition of the environment might start to push changes in some of those biological interactions that we're seeing. <clears throat> and then the other thing that we're doing is we're also working on things like fisheries. Um, so we're, our campus, we're part of a big NOAA National Research and Training Center. It's the Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystems. It's part of our NOAA's Cooperative Science Center network there. Um, it's a huge collaborative undertaking with my campus, Florida and m uh, Bethune-Cookman, Texas A&M, University of Texas are all involved. And part of what my group's doing, along with a colleague from Bethune-Cookman, is we head up the geospatial research team uh, for the center. And so one of the things that we're doing um, is we're creating, again, complex three-dimensional sort of maps that allow us to pull data out in ways we couldn't to try to make estimates between how the species we're managing or interacting with their surrounding environment. This is a place called Whaler's Cove in Point Lobos, right by Monterey. 
So what you're looking at is a high resolution map here, coupled with ground based LIDAR. So what you're looking at here, this is sort of a LIDAR interpolation of the rocky intertidal that's a seamless integration with subtidal maps. <clears throat> then what we're able to do is our side scan sonar, our multi beam, it's a high enough resolution we can actually pick up individual kelp plants on here. So what you're looking at right now, this is a point cloud for a kelp forest right now. And all that we have to do is interpolate the whole thing. And then the, the fishes, the school of fishes that go in there, they're actually dense enough you can pick them up with something like side scan or multi beam, and then you can couple that with diver surveys. So you have these really complex three dimensional models that you can pull all kinds of information out of in ways that we weren't able to in the past. And so, you know, a lot of this, if you're interested, you know, we house a lot of this on my campus. So we actually have a fairly new program called the Coastal Marine Ecosystems Program. Where we sort of archive and coordinate all of these research activities. So we serve as sort of a research and education of, uh, for the School of Natural Sciences. And so if you're interested, and, you know, I do sort of encourage you to go take a look and see what we have there. And if any of this is interested in you, you guys can always give us, a, give us a ring or send us an email. And then before I close off, I know a lot of your students out here want to kind of plug stuff. Uh, for us. If you're interested in any of this, we always have opportunities. We have lots of funding right now uh, to fund students. Uh, so our No Cooperative Center, uh, we recruit for graduate students, a master student, predominantly what we're uh, recruiting for there. Uh, master students on our campus, uh, we can provide a minimum of two years of funding, uh, $20,000 a year living stipend, so that's your salary. Plus, we also cover your full cost of tuition. Um, and then we also give you a $10,000 research scholarship to support all your research. And that's for two years uh, that you get all that. Uh, undergraduate students, we do accept transfer students. We actually have quite a few who are at Cal State. We're sort of a hub for transfer students for community colleges. For students interested in transferring at CSU Monterey Bay, we offer a similar package uh, for undergraduate students. We give uh, undergraduates two years of funding at $12,000 a year, plus a $1,000 uh, research. A scholarship on top of that. And both undergraduate and graduate students actually also get additional travel funds to go to conferences. And so we sent a bunch of students to DC uh, back in March to a massive uh, NOAA Education and Science Forum. They, they got to meet sort of the director of NOAA and the director of NOAA Education as well. Um, then I also run a fairly large uh, REU program. I think we're in our fifth year now. Um, so I think some of you might be REU students here. Um, so I direct the REU program there. It's a 10 week uh, summer program. It's open to undergraduates at the sophomore and junior level. Uh, we provide a $5,000 stipend, so a living stipend, we pay you just to live in Monterey Bay. <clears throat> we also give you a research uh, scholarship, and then we pay for your food, your room and board, your food and housing uh, for the whole summer. Uh, for these here, we have a March deadline. Uh, actually, we have a February deadline for graduate students and a March deadline for undergraduates. Uh, the REU has a February deadline uh, each year for undergraduates. Um, before I close out, just a few acknowledgments. Uh, again, the staff of the Wrigley Institute here, they always make sure we have a place to to sleep or that we always have boats and access to diving facilities. Uh, NOAA and uh, NSF for paying a lot of the bills and then BOEM uh, for recently coming in and starting to help support uh, some of the work we've been doing with the climate change impacts down here in Southern California. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> from Southern California. Maybe it was an illusion, but it looked like that was lower and it went up and down. Yeah, yeah. And your long-term data across the coast are showing the decline, but I'm just interested in if you detected in other places those peaks. We're actually seeing a little bit of that at Bird Rock. So it collapsed, the, that, the muscle bed on that west end completely collapsed, now it's back again. So there's some, that's why I was talking about the drones, like without the drones we can't, because it's I'm getting the sense it's almost like this kind of Christmas light thing. They're going off and then popping off somewhere else. And it's happening too fast that you can't, it's happening on a time scale and a spatial scale that's too broad for me to actually do as an individual person. And so this is why, you know, we have to start going to things like drones and remote sensing to start to pick it up. Because I think the traditional quadrat and meter tape method, there's, you know, fixed plot stuff, there's no way we're going to be able to pick that up. I think it's just pure chance that we happen to have a site, two sites that have been monitored for a long time where that happened. So. It seems like it's this kind of sporadic on and off trend that's happening. And uh, when you're looking at the kind of interpreting the images from the drones, you mentioned in the muscle beds about layering. But one of the things about, you know, traditional things about photo quadrants is, especially in algal beds, is layering, is not being able to see below yeah. one organism. 
Are there ways of interpolating from the images or, or ways of trying to deal with that? You can, I mean, what Dan's able to do, he's able to interpolate the vertical extent of the bed. You can't interpolate what's inside the bed. That's always going to be the challenge that we're going to have. And that's always going to be the limitation we can't do that. I think we talked about it a little bit ago, you know, if it's, you can, you probably have to do that, but if you're, you're thinking of the spatial extent, I'm talking about something, you probably can't do that all across Southern California. It probably has to be a certain site that you have to do that to get a sense of what might be going on, you know, in different types of representative sort of layered beds around Southern so there will always be jobs for field economy. Always be jobs for field economy. The drones are going to completely take over. Yeah. Data would really interesting. I guess I was wondering any here. Yeah, actually, I had this talk with Chris Lowe, and I got here because it was, it was like, like, what's going on? And. Um, the big difference between here at Fisherman's Cove and Bird Rock is fish assemblage. Um, if I come in here, you know, there's there's a lot of ground foraging fish. So you know, things like leopard shark, I think they'll, they'll eat smaller lobsters. But the other thing that's made a big comeback in here is black sea bass. Uh, they come in, they'll go after the females. I asked Larry Allen about that. He said, yeah, they'll go after the tail. In fact, like one of them scared Sean out of the water when we first came here. So I think it came out. It's like a big cow. But yeah, they, there's things that'll eat the lobsters in here. If you go out to Bird Rock, the fish assemblage isn't as diverse, which is a little odd, and I couldn't figure it out for a while. And we were out there doing daytime dives just to see where, where the lobsters were at. I remember my student Mary was like, why, why don't you, why aren't we bringing up the lobsters? Because we can really bring them on the boat. And I'm like, well, I don't know think you can lobster fish, and you can go doing that in the summer. About 10 seconds after I said that, about three large fishing, charter fishing boats came out. A bunch of guys in spear fishing gear jumped in, and they were just nailing whatever was there. So I get the sense, this has been a heavily enforced MPA. That one out there hasn't been. In this case, in fact, there was one day we were out here, and a fishing boat came over the line by accident. There, the freight boat, the freight boat that comes in, they actually made a big wide turn and chased the boat out. And I haven't seen that in other MPAs where the community actually comes in and enforces um, the MPA. In this case, so I know part of Bird Rock was got turned by an MPA, and I talked to Jack Angle about that. We keep having this debate, and no one's gone out there yet. And I think they recently made about two years ago, so they've turned Bird Rock into an MPA recently. But the corner that we work on apparently is just outside the bounds. Um, so the way that the way they have it drawn on the map, it looks like all of Bird Rock's an MPA. But when you actually put, lay out the GPS coordinates on there, the half that we work on is outside the MPA. It's the vertical wall that the divers like to dive on. That's in the MPA. Right, in this case here. So the site we're, we're working on is technically not an MPA. That's why you see all the fishing boats hanging out over there. Because they're working, they're working off the GPS coordinates and they know that they're kind of outside the MPA boundary. Yeah. It's been a little while since I've used uh, GIS, like ArcGIS, but I was curious if your drone photos could, could potentially render a bathy map of two harbors, or not two harbors, but the, the big fishing that's come out here. Because, like, whenever you, I don't know about any uh, uh, LIDAR map, like a LIDAR open source information that's actually inside the cove. I know it's, like, right outside, but I don't know of anything that's actually just in the cove here. So you're talking about, like, intertidal being LIDAR. Like, inter, well, intertidal, like, intertidal and, like, just inside the cove. Like, but I, I guess the most interesting stuff is around the intertidal. Yeah, I mean, those drones can, you can mount the LiDAR system on them. Um, and in fact, the software is fix 4 d If you use what's called an RTK system, it's a type of um, real-time kinetic GPS unit, it actually uses satellites to help sort of establish control points, and then it'll, it actually will render a 3D topography off of that. So you can actually use it with the Phantom. The Phantom 4 drone can do that. The, the Matrice, you can actually mount the LiDAR system on and get a higher resolution LiDAR system. If you're talking about underwater maps, they actually are underwater maps, they're just not published. Uh, Rick Kavitic owns them. He's never published them. He'll, he'll give, if you ask him for them, he'll, because he's got maps of this whole Fisherman's Cove that he and his group did, and they go right up to the shoreline. And so, in theory, you could actually create a whole seamless map going from the subtitle um, actually to the inner title. Do you know about um, movement of lobsters more on like a large scale? You know, you talk about bird rock versus mm -hmm. Big Fisherman's Cove, and I know that in other areas and other species of lobsters do sort of like long migrations to deeper waters. Is that at all seen here? It doesn't seem like it's happening. Um, you know, Jack Engel did his PhD work out here, and he did some tags, and I think he found one of them out at Bird Rock. He tagged a bunch here in the cove, and like he he found one out there, and. It seems like that going across from here to Bird Rock is it's a treacherous journey. 
that you're going to get, something's going to eat you before you get out there. So it seems like they eat a lot of things. You know, my, I had an undergrad out here about five years ago. He did a little genetics project. And they're all one, right, they're all one population here, where it seems you can, what you can use to differentiate populations is table isotope. In, in this case, it seems to allow you to sort of do the fine scale differentiation. And we're just not seeing those, we're not picking up sort of these isotope signals of things from the cove out at, out at Bird Rock. So it seems like that channel, even though it shouldn't be, it seems like it's acting like a natural barrier. Uh, for moving. So they're probably moving along shore. They're probably just not moving from here out to Bird Rock. No more questions? Thank you so much, Corey. Yeah, thanks, <laughs>